Can you see the screen? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Is it visible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, in my last class, uh, it was an introduction uh, to the course and what I considered is uh, how to switch from procedure oriented programming to object oriented programming because you are all familiar with C. So what we, uh, uh, to summarize what we found is this procedure oriented design, it suffers from these limitations that the cohesion of between data and procedures, if they are related, that cannot be included in a single construct. And uh, and as a result, the total reusability of code, you cannot reuse the whole code or I mean, you can the reuse is restricted only to the methods or functions. There is also less control over data. So these are the problems and in a real life scenario, if as a programmer, we try to perceive the things for any kind of computational scenario also. So the uh, the way you perceive and the way uh, I perceive might differ, but we always try to identify the items which are important in the application and try to model them in our program, right? And how many items do I identify? To what level I distinguish between the components of the item that entirely depends on the skill of that uh, particular designer or because once you have the design you, you come up with the program okay so what you found as <clears throat> no matter what uh, items we identify any item or entity that we identify can have uh, can be described in terms of its features and as well as its capabilities and the features can be modeled by a programmer or in our program through attributes or to be specific by writing variables or matrices, whatever. And the capabilities can be modeled or implemented using uh, methods or functions or subroutines, whatever you say. So the program or the language must also have the support so that both of these two can be included or uh, can be uh, integrated in a single construct. And we also found that <coughs> all the similar type of items, those who are having similar capabilities can be grouped into a particular category called class. And, and a class definition will have both those variables <coughs> as well as the functions. And those variables and functions can be you uh, uh, can be tagged with some uh, access specifiers it can be tagged as private or public depending on whether i am willing to provide access to those members because everything that is included within the class definition are members whether i am willing to uh, provide the access to the members to outside uh, uh, outside my structure outside my class if it is that i make it public if it is not i make it private and there is another protected we we can ignore for the time being and the relationship between the uh, the classes as we found strictly there are two type of relationships isa and haza and that also need to be modeled and what we found is using composition and using inheritance these two can be modeled and this process of putting together is called encapsulation, access specifiers, and those items, the, uh, I mean, every time we are talking about items, so those items are better termed in object-oriented ter terminology as objects, okay? So this, this much we have already done. So in this class, the focus will be to continue further, and we'll be talking about <coughs> another very important um, characteristics of object oriented languages that is they can uh, model polymorphism so what polymorphism is we'll try to have a, a, a very simple a basic flavor of that and uh, then we'll switch to so then we'll try to summarize the advantages of object oriented 
design or object oriented languages and we'll switch to C++ because we'll use C++ as a language. So with some basic <coughs> introduction to C++, if time permits, I'll write the first C++ code. Okay, so that is a um, basic idea. So now if I, so we talked about inheritance composition, we talked about class objects, access specifiers. Now let's see if I say, I write, I think it is visible, right? Yes, yes sir. sir. Yes, okay. sir. So if I write int x, y, z, I can write x equals to y plus z. If I write float f1, f2, f3, I can write f1 equals to f2 plus f3. And if I write, so this is possible. Uh, just a minute. So the thing is, uh, in this case, <coughs> this is the case, or if I write something like this, say sum y comma z, I assign the value to x and I write sum f2 comma f3, I assign it to f1 and then I write something like sum m1 comma m2, <clears throat> I assign it to m3 and maybe I declare m1, m2, m3 as, as something like matrix. Okay, if I write only this much, maybe I write everything within the main. So this is the main, main function. So first of all, if I consider this to be purely C, uh, a C language code. So do you think whatever we have written will be allowed? No, sir. Which part will create problems? Sir, because so sum, sum, sum function is uh, defined as, as per hmm. A bit louder because I cannot hear it clearly. Sir, uh, if sum function is, is to be defined, then it should be of a particular data type. For example, it can be of int, not both. So it will be ambiguous. No, I, I just have, so in this case, uh, the thing is how many functions I am calling here. So here, this sum and this sum. So how many functions I'm calling? I'm just calling one function. So now in, in C, the basic restriction is two functions cannot bear the same name, right? In C, can we have two functions having the same function name? Is it possible? No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. It is not possible. So those who have done C, forget about C++ or Java. In C, function names must be unique. That's the basic requirement, right? So this is not allowed because you see, you are trying to have some function which will trivially add two integer values and it will return the sum. And another function, also I would like to <coughs> use the function name as sum where I would like to add two floating point values I would like to return. So the uh, the internals of the functions are trivial, but we would like to face, uh, see that whether it is allowed or not. So if I consider C, <coughs> this is not allowed. So in C, what do we need to do? <coughs> so probably I would like sum int y comma z and here I would probably write sum float f2 comma f3. If it is a C compiler, if I would have written sum underscore int and sum underscore float, will that be allowed? Yes, sir. Now you have got two distinct function names. The function names are different and whatever you are doing, it, it is it is your business. So the compiler will allow it. <coughs> and if I try to do something like this in C compiler, so this is not allowed. But in C++, the point is uh, multiple functions or uh, more than one functions 
can have the same function names okay so definitely i have to write some piece of code for this uh, that i'll do but the thing is these two if i use a c++ compiler will it be allowed this is definitely not allowed in pure c compiler but if i use a c++ compiler will this be allowed to have yes, two functions doing something yes, different sir. but having the same function name yes sir uh, yes sir those who are uh, those who are not uh, used to to c c++ or java any kind of object oriented programming this might seem something strange right because you say that how can these two functions bear the same name but you see there is a subtle difference so this sum is uh, accepting two integers and this sum is accepting two floating point values so the thing is uh, who should be who should be able to distinguish and how how to distinguish this so definitely visibly there is no dif difference because both the function names are same and who is going to create the distinction can you just tell me type of parameter type of argument and type of parameter list and the return type can uh, any one of you speak a bit louder and tell me what do you say the type the type of parameter type and of the type parameter. Parameter. and the type but of type is fine but when you compile this who is going to take care so if so the compiler compiles one by one the lines when it comes to this line so definitely to support this i should have a sum say int a int b int and then i write return a plus b is that fine so this uh, i would expect that when i call this it, this this copy should be uh, linked right and corresponding to this function this sum i would like to have something like float say maybe p float q right so i would expect that whenever the compiler compiles this i expect this copy of sum should be this body should be uh, executed is that fine both the functions are having the same name but they differ in the arguments that they accept so if i write these two functions what i expect from the compiler when the compiler comes here it should actually give a call to this function and when it compiles this one it, this should be a uh, some kind of notation which will uh, take the control to this function is that fine so how to make this happen that the point is this need to be done and we accept or i say that uh, c++ compiler allows this so how how do you what do you think that how the compiler can allow such things to happen i mean how it will handle the kind of uh, this this level of transparency or abstractness are you getting my question yes sir sir uh, they just sir when they see that there are two float values they identify float sum and then return is that what happens like yes. so the see the simple the thing is signature. the simple thing is what what the compiler does the compiler decorates the function names so you wrote for your so whose convenience it is it is your convenience because you know it's basically i am trying to add two uh, two variables no matter what their data type is right so you you prefer to use the same name sum and sum but what the compiler will do when the comp during compilation when the compiler finds that there are multiple copies with the same name it will decorate this sum okay I, let me use some different colors some uh, other color maybe this one so it will decorate it as sum underscore int underscore int okay and then int int like this so this sum the this function name should be decorated or it will rename this function as this and it will rename this function as sum float underscore float and do the rest of it got the point so this is the additional you know something that the compiler does uh, in the uh, in the you know back end and this also there is no point now once this is translated so this sum never uh, remains like this so it will translate it to this and this also will be translated to sum underscore float underscore float now if if the compiler translates this now 
is there any any ambiguity that remains no sir no so sir. this thing no, uh, this thing happens actually so when the c compiler uh, c uh, compiler so designer of c++ brown uh, strauss stroke so when he implemented he thought of something like this now based on the implementation because we cannot see this so like how this decoration is done whether it is so this is just one scheme that one the compiler can follow so this is actually done so if you if you are able to or somehow you can you know stop at some point while this this takes place you will find that there is no such ambiguity because the compiler has already uh, actually renamed the functions with the same name but which differs with argument so you can basically rename the function by tagging with the argument names in some form and make a distinction so once this happens you know then uh, as a result what happens like when you look into the uncompiled code we find that there may be multiple functions bearing the same name but definitely that there, there must be some distinction in the number and the type of the arguments that they accept so that is so this particular feature of object oriented uh, languages is known as what it is called function overloading okay so this is called function overloading now why is the term overloading called so sometimes you see i mean uh, generally uh, say if i look into the hod stuff so our department hod what she does she need to take classes so he she is basically a faculty right so so her primary task is to take classes that's why uh, she took the job and she she was uh, she likes teaching so that is the reason but once she is assigned the post of hod she is supposed to handle the administrative load also right so now what is what she says that i am now overloaded so why overloaded because there is a primary task but she is assigned some additional tasks and she is now overloaded so the thing is uh, now when she is in the class what she does when she is in the class taking a lecture what role she is playing as a teacher so she she just keeps teaching when she enters our office she just behaves like a hod okay so uh, signs papers and all on all this like that at the same person when she comes home she plays the role of a you know a normal person a housewife or whatever what the point so the same person in this case the same function acts differently depending on what what you can call it as the same function different uh, acts differently depending on the depending on what depending on depending on the argument the parameter the situation depending on the context you know so the context is a very common term used in our you know in our computational uh, terminology also so it's depending on the context so the context changes your behavior changes or i mean uh, your action changes so here also the same thing the sum if you pass two integers it will it will trigger this and it will it will just add two integers if you call sum with two floats it will call this va this value so like that so the same person if you put it in the hod's office she will behave like hod if you put the same person in the in a lecture hall she will start delivering lectures like that so depending on the context that changes so this is what is called overloading and is also sometimes known as sorry so this is also known as can you see this is known as polymorphism okay so why polymorphism poly means multiple and uh, multiple shapes of whatever so the same name but we know that uh, although it, and uh, what is the advantage in uh, implementing this function overloading who is benefited out of it who is benefited user the, the programmer user means if, if i uh, if i am reading your code or if i am the designer i am the programmer 
so i don't have to really keep track and you know uh, scratch my head to find out what should be the name which should be meaningful function name meaningful but also different from the one that i gave last time like that so you don't have to worry about finding out unique function names that will semantically you know sound similar but will do something different so this is the and if i read your code okay so i also will be happy because i will find that okay it's some means i know it's they are basically adding something or you know combining something this is what some means got the point so this is this is a feature uh, and you can see that in the real world also some uh, it is not a modeling feature but it is some some kind of feature that provides abstraction to the code of what we see and the readability also gets increased and the thing is in real life such things really happen as i mentioned and each one of us play multiple roles multiple way may behave uh, in a different way depending on the situation or the context so those are defined sometimes now the thing is what we did here is we are trying to see that how the sum or the same function name works with what this int and float is these are all what is int and what is float inbuilt data types these are inbuilt data types and what about this one matrix is a user defined data type so definitely matrix there is no data type matrix which you have found in uh, c right there is no such things and in c++ also there is no such things let us assume that we don't uh, uh, have any kind of specific or special libraries or templates or whatever okay so make things simple so in the standard c++ in the standard c there is no such data type which is known as matrix but we know that we can create a matrix in uh, in c++ or in c now what about this this last statement or this last one so this sum m1 plus m2 so will this be allowed first of all will will this be allowed that you use the same function name sum to add to matrices also will that be allowed yes say for define yes yes will it be allowed yes sir yes sir so if i would yes. like to have it so what do i need to do i have to write some piece of code okay so now so probably i have to write another sum because i i just write the same sum and i i just uh, uh, assume that the compiler will take care of the you know creating distinctions by decorating the names and all this so i don't care so then matrix m1 uh, or matrix say x and matrix y and here i write whatever it is so here i have to write basically two for loops and all these details should be there but then again i mean where should i write this body of the function all those details i am not getting into so that we'll see later on the syntax and all this so the point is this function overloading that is using the same function name to perform more or less similar activities with different uh, with a difference in the types of uh, arguments that it takes it can work or we can consider it for inbuilt data types and also for uh, user defined data types here matrix is a user defined data types hopefully somebody has written a matrix class because in c++ or in object oriented language as i mentioned so you should be you are expected to put the required methods <clears throat> along with the related data together in a single construct so here probably earlier only there is a there is a function uh, i mean there is something like this class matrix and where you have actually defined uh, i mean declared the uh, say a two dimensional array say maybe 10 comma 10 and then you have written some number of row size then column size okay so this is these are the features of the matrix class features or characteristics and then you have written something like uh, like matrix initial so you have to initialize you have to write an initialization function okay and you have to write maybe some display function 
okay all the details of the display then probably you write some sum function okay so the details of the sum and you basically put everything together in the same construct you see so here this means this class matrix so these are the set of methods again don't just uh, try to follow the syntax because syntax <coughs> a lot of things just to put you uh, into uh, uh, just express the idea so these are the characteristics and these are the methods or capabilities that the matrix uh, any matrix object can do so this i have done so here maybe within this you have to uh, write the body of the sum function so if you have written that then this also would have worked okay that's the case so here uh, i mean so now once once this is there assuming that this is there if i write matrix m1 m2 m3 so what are these m1 m2 m3 what is m1 what is m2 what is m3 sir object so now you could have called it as variable because it is very much is uh, what is this xyz then what is xyz what is x y and z variables variables hmm? variables okay so you still prefer to call it as variable right but probably if you are using c++ you see syntactically so this is more of a c++ like code so uh, if you are really inclined to c++ and if you know that it is uh, it is a object oriented language i am using so you should better not call it as a variable you should be prefer uh, you should prefer calling it as object because as variable is a instance of a data type here this class uh, i mean this object is a instance of what class is the instance of class. Class. class and can you recall i mean so do you accept it as an encapsulation you are encapsulating methods as well as so you have got a you know bag where you can put methods and you can you can add the variables also so the process of you know binding or putting them together is basically known as encapsulation so this encapsulation is supported right you can have multiple just methods the body the function bodies and you can have those you know these uh, these variables those are characteristics you can bind so this is what encapsulation means okay so there is a more generic term that we uh, use while talking about encapsulation what is that can you recall you know data structure class we have encountered the term what is that <coughs> have you heard about edt yes sir yes sir edt what is edt abstract data type abstract data type right so can you find any analogy with edt and class what edt yes, what sir. is the uh, if i say that uh, stack is a abstract data type right what does it mean that uh, means you have so write the uh, write stack as a abstract data type so what you should have written you should have mentioned the one dimensional array you should have mentioned the integer uh, top you should have mentioned the size of the stack and then you should have also included the push pop uh, uh, display yes. everything there right so together it becomes a abstract data type can you recall yes hello yes sir so now you find that that abstract data type in c is there any way of implementing abstract data type although the concept was there while we studied data structure <clears throat> have you been ever uh, have you ever been able to implement abstract data type in c language yes you were writing a stack you were trying to define the stack data structure but can you really put the uh, the push the pop the one dimensional array the top everything together is that possible in c sir encapsulation is not possible so no, sir not separate possible. functions in true sense abstract data type although it is very much you know uh, you are trying to define a cohesive uh, you know come up with a cohesive definition but that concept cannot be implemented in c so that's why you, you don't have the facility so you just okay, told okay fine so what to do i just leave the function scattered as well as the data structure scattered so all 
because there is no way of putting them together now in c c++ or in any object oriented you know language it has got this feature of encapsulation where you can truly use it to implement the edit and once you have done that you should from now on prefer to call a instance of edit or so edit is a generic term you can say that in object oriented terminology or in a language terminology we call it as a class so everything you can think of that everything is a class so integer is also in this case because it is c++ you can say it's a integer class it's a float class instead of data type you say it's a abstract data type kind of so if you have used that term so this instance of a class should be better known as object instead of calling it as variable okay so i say that int x so now you say that this is a integer integer class and this x is a object of the integer class right although i know that uh, after all uh, yeah it is that same variable but we will we'll be preferring to use the same the different terminologies from now on up to this is it fine yes sir yes, yes sir okay so so we are gradually trying to switch from c plus uh, from c from procedure oriented concepts uh, the beliefs that we have uh, gradually we are trying to you know take one by one the steps towards the new paradigm and because uh, and why you use c plus plus because it is uh, compatible syntactically and also there are many things overlapping so that it's, it becomes uh, you know much easier for a programmer to uh, you know switch from here to here and in fact the designer of c++ i mean who designed c++ strauss group also uh, designed in in that way because as if it is an extension of c that's why the plus plus uh, is used i mean he used a nice name to know what it means actually right so this is one thing uh, what we call it as function overloading the other part of the story is something like this as you can see here see what is this what is this operator this is an operator right this is a binary operator so this binary operator what is what it is capable of doing this binary operator now it is capable of adding to integers but here what it does it is capable of adding to floating point var variables right <clears throat> now if i write something like this what does it mean so this is again the same binary operator <coughs> here it adds to integers and returns a value here it adds to floating point vari uh, variables and adds and here what i am supposed to do i mean what I, what the machine is supposed to do add to complex. complex so what is this complex is there any such complex uh, any such class or such data type known as complex that is already there in c++ or c no sir no, it is not there no, sir. so probably you, like matrix you have to yourself write it for your convenience right so if you have written that now you say that okay because these are just like a complex number integer float these are all like values so i would like to have the same readability to write this instead of writing say some c2 comma c3 equals to c1 so this would have also worked fine but i would like to have this instead of this so definitely as you can see this is much better this is a better choice than this because whenever read somebody reads definitely the logic of adding to complex numbers and logic of adding to integers are different because in complex numbers you add the real part and the imaginary part separately and then you store it but again readability of the program increases if i if i do this so here again there is some kind of polymorphic codes we are trying to enforce what is that who is getting overloaded here earlier the function name got overloaded right the sum 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 the same name is called and it is acting differently either this or this or this 
depending on the arguments that you are passing and here in this example or in this case who is getting overloaded operator so operator the operator specifically the binary operator so you are trying to see the binary operator it was already adding uh, it was capable and it was responsible for adding integers float character maybe something else also okay the long int and all this now you say that i overburden it i i add one more responsibility so now he says that i am really overburdened so don't overload me so and you and you keep on overloading so in c++ or in any object oriented language this is another feature that becomes handy so the operator starts complaining but you 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 become happy because your code becomes more compact more readable and more understandable to you also and to whoever if i see the code i can instantly and you really don't have to search for a suitable name because symbols carry more much compact meaning uh, you know compared to words so like that so here the problem is uh, so instead of doing this i basically prefer to do this and this addition operator so this also would have worked if this is the case then you say that why not this will work so if i write m1 equals to m2 plus m3 can this work so somebody if he is you know already sustaining some pressure you, you say that let me put some more pressure onto it so now this addition operator we can make some provisions so that it ca uh, so if you pass um, or if you have two matrix object arguments these are matrix objects m1 m2 so if this matrix objects arguments are there it knows how to add them also definitely using two for loops but i mean that is that you have to write what exactly you have to do but this can be done right so what we can call it as then so this is definitely this is also an example of overloading and what kind of overloading i should call it earlier the function name is getting overloaded so it is function overloading and in this example who is getting overloaded operator operator overloading operator overloading and what is the operator it is basically a symbol right so operator is basically a symbol and every language no matter what it is c c++ java or whatever there is a uh, you know finite set of operators which is defined some of them are unary some of them are binary some of them are ternary also can you name a ternary operator addition hmm addition plus which one plus addition addition no no ternary operator three operators question Take mark and colon operators. question mark and colon question mark colon okay question mark and then colon this one so the thing is so any operators now you say that uh, you can count maybe the balagro swami book or many other books like kanitkar book at the end of the book you will find there is a list of operators right and you know that who, who is ternary who is unary and who is binary and all this so the thing is any operator you pick up you you say that i must be able to overload it because the feature is provided by the compiler right or by the language itself so the point is it is not that the, the it is there there are because of some reasons we will see later on we're talking about function overload i mean operator overloading that some of the operators are not overloaded right uh, because of ambiguity we will see wh why but you can say that majority of the operators are allowed to be overloaded for for whom now the these operators are already overloaded with respect to what with respect to the inbuilt data types right just now you mentioned you saw this so you see the plus is already overburdened it is already overloaded because it can work it can add to integers it can add to floats but when you say it's operator overloading you mean that these operators which already can perform in uh, i mean they can have in a overloaded fashion they can perform with inbuilt data types you can extend the idea to make them overload or make them function differently for any user defined data types also like matrix or like complex class like stack or whatever okay so this is what over operator overloading means but definitely there is a restriction we'll see later that some of the operators are not allowed to be overloaded but the point is a binary operator remains binary if you if it is a binary operator you cannot use it as a unary form so it's uh, arity 
its precedence, everything remains unchanged, but you can assign a different meaning or responsibility to it. Now, before we, uh, you know, uh, uh, just get into the other uh, topic, can you, uh, can anybody tell me that how it is internally managed? Now, the thing is, uh, I know that I, I am happy that this is, okay, I am happy that this is where it is gone. Say this, uh, if I, if I get into the same matrix, so matrix, I, I, I write matrix M1, M2, M3. Now I would like to have, so maybe this is the end of the class definition, right? Now here within the main, can you see this? Within the main, I am declaring three objects of matrix M1, M2, M3, and I would like to have something like this M1 equals to M2 plus M3. Now what they contain, I don't care about right now, but I want to have this kind of syntax. So what do you think the compiler should do or what you are supposed to do to support this operator overloading or whenever the compiler scans through this particular or parses through this particular statement what changes the compiler makes are, are you aware of it do you anybody of you know those who have worked in java or maybe c plus plus i'm talking about the internals what the compiler does like the previous one in case of function overloading you just now found what the compiler does here what it does So checks the parameters. Yeah, it, it basically Uses decorates. You can say decorates or it you know modifies the function name and uh, by padding the you know the data types so that they become unique. That is what it does. It's some kind of convention can be placed. But here what it does, what kind of translation takes place to this statement by a C compiler? Because you want something uh, you want some kind of abstraction. But to get the abstraction done, some uh, some uh, burden need to be taken by somebody, right? So the compiler takes the burden. So what it does? Any idea? What kind of translation takes place? Sir, Have you heard about the operator objects, function? The objects are identified by their type of classes assigned. No, that is fine. But have you heard of operator function? Okay, let us not go get into the much details, but it is something like this. It gets translated to this, right? So this, whatever you see is this one, but when, the, when it gets compiled, it gets translated. So what it means, you see, this is an object and this is what? What is this? This is a dot operator. So dot operator means, uh, using the dot operator in the structure, in the C structure also, we have used dot operator, right? To refer to a particular member of that structure. Can you recall, all of you? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So the same dot operator is used here. What it says, this M2 is an object of matrix class. So this M2 invokes, what is this? Operator plus, and then this M3 is passed as an argument. So this operator plus is basically a operator function. It's a kind of special function, okay? So what what this means, this gets translated to this. So what it means, M2, the first argument to be specific, the first object argument, the first object invokes this special operator function and passes a second argument, uh, say second arg uh, this uh, argument of this binary operator into it, okay? And then, so, this operator plus is a function basically. So where do you think this operator function should be defined? Who should define and who should take care of this? As like that sum or whatever. So this operator operator plus should be placed where? Where it should be placed? Third in the main. So this function, the body of this function must be somewhere defined within the class, right? In the class definition, it must come. Are you getting my point? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Or in other words, again, uh, let me tell you, don't be, uh, I mean, those who are the first timer, you know, trying to learn the C++ language, 
so these each and every uh, uh, of these concepts will be elaborated in much much details just i i would like to have a provide you the flavors uh, because i am focusing on the features not the syntax and the you know other detail technical issues but it's just a point that i i, I thought that I, I should be mentioning so that you know that uh, because c++ java you know for long i mean these days even from class 7 8 people are learning the students are learning but the focus is something different they learn to write algorithms or those small loops and all some of you you know go a bit ahead of that and develop some kind of applications but we probably don't bother about the you know compilation how it takes care of how it's like in a python do you need to specify a data type if you would like to store some values in an array in no. python no sir no sir no sir i mean those who know python so now can you imagine that uh, here in c we have to specify it's a integer it's a long int in the, it's a you know long long int like that you to be so you have to be so specific i know to keep big so specify the size of the array because everybody knows c and c++ you are trying to you know make a bit things a bit more abstract you are hiding everything there and you are hiding something there and in python it it goes in another extreme so you don't have to specify the type of the data you just write the name of the array and you uh, you know initialize array that's all so who is going to take care of it definitely the compiler the runtime environment in the back end need to take care of this so nothing is nothing comes with uh, with the expense of some you know additional overhead but the overhead and that's why c is c c++ is faster because you are more explicit but when you try to uh, you know try to have more abstraction probably uh, you slow down the process so that's why that is one reason why you may not be uh, willing to uh, write python codes for all kinds of computational scenarios but again so the point is this this abstraction so this is abstraction right you are trying to uh, overload and it seems it appears that the same plus binary uh, operator works for matrix for complex class also but the compiler if i know the compiler translates it like this so to support this we have to basically write a function called operator plus here okay so we have to basically write here uh, okay so so here something like operator plus so this means this is a function name so this operator plus if you are try to overload the minus then it is operator minus so operator is a kind of keyword and you have to specify that particular function name so how many arguments it accepts one argument so it's like matrix x what it returns again a matrix type argument so this it returns and then you write the details of it basically two for loops and all so got the point how it is done so what we see it is very easy but actually as a programmer you are doing the things uh, you are making things easy for who are whoever is using your class so if you are the class designer if you have made this provision if i am the user of the class i can uh, i can write smart and compact codes right so this is what we mean as function overloading and operator overloading excuse me sir hello sir uh, is this not becoming same as that of the sum function same as that of sum function sum Yes, <clears throat> see, so same means sum. You have written your own name. You have given your own function name. But here, the function name definitely. The point is, you have to write that specific function here within the class body, within the class definition. But again, I mean, if you think of like the sum, also the uh, the internals, the body of the function is the same, but the function name is different. and because of the difference of the function name you have got much more compact calls like you can write m1 plus m2 but as you mean that uh, if i am writing the uh, if i come here so whatever is written here and whatever is written here is it's all the same yeah that's true because that you you actually want to have them the same way right do you want that m1 m2 or m2 plus m3 will be added do you expect this sum and this operator plus will return some different results you don't right yes sir hello yes sir so you actually write the same thing but then because of the difference so here you are giving a different name which is meaningful and which is not so you know a matrix uh, sounds matrix like it's a sum that's all but here it is operator plus and you can just use a symbol for this <coughs> okay sir thank you sir okay so that is how the function overloading me, and sir. operator overloading I don't know why it is getting removed every time. 
so these are so this is another way of so operator overloading you can call it as this also is an example of writing uh, polymorphic codes right so it's a polymorphism it's a operator Excuse symbol polymorphism me, it's a function name polymorphism do you know other kind of polymorphism that exists in the object oriented languages any other examples of polymorphism i'm asking to those who have who are already familiar and aware of writing big codes in so java we have, so yes? we can have a runtime sort of runtime polymorphism yes. which is, is uh, also known as method overriding hmm. now runtime polymorphism yeah. can you uh, specify the a, name sir method overriding mm. Okay. Any any other names, generic names that you find? Have you heard about virtual functions? Virtual functions. Have you heard about virtual yes, functions? Sir. Okay. Again, uh, those who are not aware of, just forget about it. You will uh, at the end of the course, you will all be aware of it, and you know not only the names but also how it implements and what are the you know internal details, or how the compiler handles it. So this is not the case. But again, those who know it already, they can relate it. Uh, sir templates can uh, be a part of yes uh, template uh, also is is a kind of polymorphism yes so what is template is you see uh, i mean you can understand everybody can understand those who even know c also say if i write uh, if i ask you write a stack code write a code for stack i and i don't mention anything so what you what kind of array you should define i don't mention anything but i will say that write a code for implementing stack what you would have done one d array sir so one d array one d array but i am asking about the type of the array what type of array would have you would have declared use the template null hmm? an empty array an empty array no no empty means i mean i i i ask you to write the code so maybe without guessing anything if i start giving an example i said okay let me take its integer array or i mean the integer stack so when i give us when i say you should implement a stack probably you tend to if i don't specify anything you implement a integer stack say for example but then you wrote a integer stack i i told you okay no no i i want a floating point stack so then what you do see the data structure is the same right you are still defining a stack you are writing the code for stack and so it's like int a10 int top and then you have the push then you have the pop all these things right so push uh, push means you have to write int uh, say a which you are actually want to pop uh, push pop actually returns int like this so this works so now when you bring it to me i say that no no i i want a floating point stack so will the same code work where you need to make changes No, sir. So we need to change yeah. the type. Of Where you want to make changes? You want to make it float. You want to make it float. You want to make it float, right? Again, after that. one week, I I I tell you that okay, no, no, I want a character stack. Just bring me a character stack. So then again, you write a another piece of code. See the point. Everything is same. Almost everything is same. You just keep on changing the data types because what essentially what I mean to say is the data structure is the same. The methods that you apply on the data structure are the same. the logic is the same the only thing is the contents the elements of the data structure the type gets changed right so so why should i you, you should start shouting that why should i write every time the same logic the same piece of code just changing those into float float to character this this what what's happening so then c++ helps you or any object oriented language helps you say that okay you just cool down so there is a way of doing things you just instead of writing here int and so make it generic so don't specify anything let it be like this t what is t t is a symbol that's all and once it is t and you have written sometime like a stack stack class like this so you have the facility like you have to write stack int and you have to write a so this becomes a integer stack like the stack float it's a floating point stack stack character you have got a character stack right like this okay 
again i mean there is some template this uh, t and all this it's all there but the thing is this is so even the c programmers can you see the facility <clears throat> so you just have defined the data structure stack by encapsulation you have included the push and the pop along with the character uh, along along with the uh, variables right but not only that wherever you found that the data type might be different in different cases you have made it generic ttt like this and once i ask you just uh, provide me a integer stack you instantiate it as an integer stack float stack character stack like this so this is also a kind of polymorphic so this particular definition is polymorphic right this definition of the stack data structure is polymorphic it can act as a integer definition integer stack definition it can be used as a floating point stack definition like this so that's why we come to this point that so this part we have already explained earlier in the last class right now here this polymorphism is the ability to assign different meaning to a particular symbol operator method or class and polymorphism enables one common interface for many implementations i think you can relate to these words by this time right it provides one common interface for many varying implementations and for objects to act differently under different circumstances or context whatever you say and static polymorphism will differentiate it later on you will you'll be able to appreciate the difference but right now this function overloading operator overloading templates these are static compile time polymorphism so during compilation this polymorphism so who is taking the burden so the compiler takes the burden of implementing the polymorphism uh, i mean the polymorphic nature by changing the function names by uh, you know changing the fun those operator calls also by you know making some changes in the you know when you define a template so this previous example this is i don't know why why it is so it it automatically became volatile every time i write i switch back to it it, it goes off i don't know how it is happening anyway hello so sir this is hello, hello? sir hello sir is sir is type casting of a pointer is some kind of polymorphism passing of a pointer passing of void pointer you can say but yeah the thing is uh, you can put it in other way like uh, if you want to implement uh, polymorphic codes probably you rely on void pointers right because void is a basically generic type now void you can type cast to integer to type cast to float and all this so using void pointers you probably achieve polymorphism rather than you say that void pointer is a polymorphism so it's a tool that you use to achieve polymorphism to uh, to write polymorphic codes is is that fine yes sir yes sir we will see it later on because there are many questions i am trying to put everything here so that you uh, i mean for others also they get motivated okay why should we study c++ or object oriented programming and uh, what are the advantages so you will be able to appreciate the advantages and you you know that uh, uh, we have to use it in our codes okay so this dynamic or runtime polymorphism one is virtual function that we just now mentioned another is dynamic cast is there anybody who has used dynamic casting rtti type casting so in c we have used type casting so this is more of a static casting and we can go for dynamic casting also so we'll see it later anybody who is aware of the term dynamic casting down casting sir, dynamic casting sir heard it before but never used it hello louder a bit louder sir heard the term but never really yes, used so these are there i mean we'll will be will be encountering these terms later on okay so that's a, you know it's a whole bunch of things that you uh, that you'll be able to learn if you know c++ so to just sum it up object oriented design advantages the real world abstraction can be so it's a real world uh, it can be modeled in a much better way the real world encapsulation ability to bind data and method together to obtain more cohesive modules this is one advantage hiding the ability to hide private class members both members when i say member it can be data or methods both so that they cannot be accessed from other uh, outside so you have got more Uh, importance and more control over data 
inheritance it's a, it increases reusability because through the inheritance if b is derived uh, or i mean b is uh, a that means a is already there and you are trying to define b so you can use the definition of a for define definition of b so you don't have to write b from the scratch you just say that what are the additions that i need to make okay so the definition can be reused so that is increases reusability the inheritance and here during inheritance or is a, this is called the base class this is called a derived class okay this is the terminology that we use polymorphism we just now uh, talked a lot about it so this is programmer friendly this if i use multiple types of polymorphism programmer friendly and it increases the code re re readability and there are other advantages also and easy to maintain and in fact uh, those things like uh, in the python there are many tricks i mean it's not tricks but th there are many magical things that happen uh, like you don't have to define the data type and it works so for a c programmer who know the low level basics so he will be quite surprised at how it happens how the compiler and the language handles all these details because it's not that the um, you know the the machine that we are using got changed so everything is the same and how the language becomes uh, so intelligent that even if you don't specify the data type it is storing whatever comes it stores like this so uh, to know this we have to know polymorphism and how it is working and this is easy to maintain because uh, you know you are dealing with more cohesive modules so any kind of changes that you make you are make you, you can make sure that i am changing the definition and the rest will be intact so uh, because the coupling is uh, less now okay so these are the advantages so can you draw the analogy here what will be the analogous terms okay so uh, when is the next class that you are having sir in 15 minutes sir hello sir it starts in 15 minutes only sir we have to come 5 minutes early we have been told to join the class 5 minutes early uh, so when it starts uh, 4:30 uh, sir it should start at 4:30 but we have been told to join early because it's our first class sir Uh, so uh, uh, may I be able to take another uh, five, seven eight minutes? So now it is four ten, or I need to stop it right now. Uh, so probably we can we can do it. Okay, another minutes. five minutes. Yes, sir, yes. Sir. We just alert me. Uh, okay, within another five minutes. See, so uh, can you just quickly draw the analogy? Data type in procedure oriented programming. What do we call it as? Class. Class data type class right class variable class variable object 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 function object. procedure subroutine method method methods so those who are not aware you should know that you should keep talking about methods okay more than and function call function call it's a something a strange term it's called message passing right. so we were invoking the uh, method defined in a class we call it as through the object instance of that it's called using the dot operator that we just now did so it is called uh, uh, message passing kind of and header file so in the procedure oriented programming if you define a header file if you uh, try to link a header file so in the header file what it contains it's a library of pre written functions and procedures what do we expect here in object oriented programming a library file we include what what it will include different classes different classes different classes so pre class and methods. class definitions you can expect some pre written class definitions that is possible sort of what else you can expect you can expect simple um, uh, like library functions also because in c++ it is not like java that everything should be each and everything should be object oriented it is kind of hybrid it supports procedure uh, design also it supports uh, object oriented design also parallelly but the point is here as you can see so these are all the same and in object oriented approach abstract data type or you can say it's a class but what i what i what i'm trying to highlight this point can you see this pre declared objects so it is not only that you are uh, when you in the header files in c++ in c++ you are having predefined classes but you also have predefined objects the instance of the classes are also sometimes predefined so you, if you just use it uh, you, you can just start using it without explicitly declaring it we will see that 
while writing the first C code, what is, what are such objects, predefined objects. Got my point? Yes, sir. Have you got the point? <clears throat> it's not only a class yes. library. Sometimes it may be considered to be that few objects are also defined for your convenience. So this is uh, what is the language abstraction is in the assembly level. You write probably to store 12, 5 and uh, say 12 or say 10 to store 12, 5 and 10. In some memory location, you write uh, that uh, 12 stored in register B, register C. So in three registers, CPU registers you write. If you would like to write in procedure oriented programming like C, you write here integer X, these things like this. And in an object oriented language like Python, you can just write this. Is that allowed? The last one, this one? Yes, sir. Yes, yes, yes sir. sir. And in yes. fact, there is even something more surprising, at least for many of us who are not very much familiar with Python, Python coding like this. What does it mean? So it's a kind of hybrid. Uh, so even if you are not putting uh, you know homogeneous kind of elements forget about declaring what type x is forget about uh, declaring the size of it forget about you know allocating the space for it you just write this and the whole thing is handled internally so it's uh, something quite a magic those who are here okay for them and for them it is really a high level of abstraction which is supported and which is possible if you write object oriented codes by implementing polymorphism and all these details right i think it's almost the time so uh, this is object based and object oriented language and this c++ is basically an object oriented language and it includes all the object based language features like class definition object definition access specifiers automatic this garbage collection and operator overloading so thing is the object based languages like ada and modula it was invented in 1983 they are object based languages and this object oriented languages includes all these features, but this inheritance function overloading, virtual function, late binding and all this. So C++, Java, Python and C, C hash, these are all object oriented language and uh, in C++ we'll be learning all these uh, in details, the syntax, the underlying philosophy and uh, what are the challenges and how the compiler handles it. Okay. So this is the end of the class. This is the reason why we uh, uh, still stick to C++ because as you can see that it is in still in the fifth position among the different set of languages in January 2021. It, uh, so this has been I just copied today only today morning and this is the long term history as you can see here from 1985 because it was uh, first published in 1985 it was in 12th position and then it came in the first position uh, like uh, during our college days. But then again, uh, it slipped back because of you know Python, Java. Java got into the scenario in late 90s, and then gradually now, but still it is holding its position in the third or fourth place in, in 2020, right? So you can still see that uh, how consistent it is, and there are lots of softwares which are still written in C++ or C, and and C you can see that still it is moved in uh, two. So the C and C++ can still uh, be a uh, something that the recruiters look for okay that's the let me switch off the stop the recording <clears throat>